Do, as you guys can probably imagine, one of the things that's interesting about being in the position that I'm in is that you know we'll have folks who who come and and they'll they'll visit and and then the, you know some people decide to stick around, some people decide to move on. That's fine either way. Um, and then you have some folks who who are really interested in uh, in, in, in our theological perspective. You know, kind of where do we where do we come from? How do we feel about certain aspects of, of theology? Some months ago, actually, it's probably well over a year ago now, there was a, a couple that was coming here, and and, uh, and I got an email from them. Um, this is in case everybody starts looking around, and trying to figure out who it is. Uh, that, that they don't they don't come here. Um, but I thought it was interesting. My interaction was with them interesting. This is not out of the unusual, by the way, that I would get an email from somebody who's visited and said, what, what does your church teach about this? Or how do they feel about that? Or whatever the case may be. And, and in this particular case, it really wasn't anything that I thought was really controversial. But it was, um, they, they asked me specifically what I thought about a specific issue. Like he said, doesn't matter what it is. And, uh, and so I, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. So I was kind of... Uh, you know, seeing where, where this could be ended up heading out that, that, you know, maybe they would take issue with something that, that I had said or whatever it is I was going to reply to. So I thought, you know, the best way to do this, the only way that I know to do it is to actually reply and, and, and load it with Scripture, right? I don't know any other way. They weren't asking my opinion. They were asking, what do you teach from this? What is your, what is your position on this or the church's position, whatever? And I don't know any other way to do it. I mean, I, I don't know any other way to engage somebody on that level without talking about what Scripture talked about. So I gave my response, and I loaded it with, you know, this passage here and this passage here. And it was over and over and over and over and over. Again, all the Scripture that showed why I believed what I believed and why I taught whatever it is that, that, that I was teaching. And so I got a response back. And they said a lot of things. But one of the things they didn't say, one of the things that was conspicuously absent in their well-worded and well-thought-out and kind, polite response, nobody was mad, nobody was pointing fingers or anything, but the one thing that was missing was, can you guess it? Scripture. What else was missing? Talking about how I'd gotten the Scripture that I'd sent them wrong. So they, they, when they answered back, they answered back, but... We've known lots of people who, you know, lots of good people who, really nice people who, but nothing, nothing scriptural at all. No refutation of the scripture that I use. You're wrong about that, that interpretation of that. Nothing. It had nothing to do with anything other than kind of how they felt about it more than anything else. And so if I pared all of that down, if I cut out all the extraneous stuff that I'm talking about, here in essence was the basis of their argument. We know what God's Word says about this, but that's, that's really what it was. They weren't saying God didn't say this. They weren't saying the Scripture didn't teach what I was telling them that they were teaching. They just simply, oddly enough, didn't care. And i got to tell you something. I don't understand that. If I live to be a million, which I hope never happens, I will not understand that. Peter doesn't understand that. <laughs> this is why he's writing this letter in the way that he's writing it. If you've been here for any amount of time, you know that one of the things that I have talked about, in fact, it, you, you guys know that we put out a blog every week? If you don't know that, you shouldn't know it, because the guy who writes it, man, that guy is spot on. <laughs> you need to read this thing. It's one of the best blogs I have ever read in my entire life. I can't recall who it was that writes it, but it, it's really good. And it, it's something, actually, I'm joking around, it's me. But uh, um, I mentioned this in, in, in the blog post for this week. You do, of course, realize that the entire fall of humanity the entirety of the fall of humanity was precipitated by four simple words. That's it. Four simple words that the serpent came and spoke to Eve and said, Did God 
really say. That's it. <laughs> That's all it took. Did God really say the entire fall of humanity was precipitated by that one simple question? And really one word in the question, the word really. Why, am I, why are we talking about this? Because the root of all of this is the tactic that our adversary continues to use is don't trust his word. Don't trust his word, trust mine. Every single aspect of false teaching stems from the idea that God's word is inherently untrustworthy and you have to get my take on it or I have to give you my assessment of it or my view of it as opposed to just looking at his word. That's what Peter's talking about here. He's been setting up the last couple of weeks we've been talking about this in the first chapter. He's been setting up this idea of true north. We talked about that last week. He's trying to set up the standard so that we can see the deviation from the standard. You don't know if something deviates from the truth if you don't know the truth. And let me reiterate again this over and over and over again. All right? He's not talking about teachers who get something accidentally wrong. He's not talking about teachers who get something wrong out of ignorance, whether it's intentional ignorance or even accidental ignorance. He's not talking about that. He's talking about people who should know better, who do know better, but they're deceiving you anyway. This is not about getting something wrong. We mentioned Apollos last week. I talked to you about Apollos last week when Priscilla and Aquila came across him and found out what a dynamic teacher he was and everybody was wowed. By the way, Apollos to me is one of the most interesting people in the New Testament because we know almost nothing about him and yet when Paul is warning people about sectarianism early in the Corinthians, letter to the Corinthians, he says, some of you say that I am of Peter, some of you say I am of Paul, some of you say I am of Jesus and he said, some of you say I am of Apollos. Apollos was mentioned in the same breath with Peter, Paul and Jesus. So obviously this guy was a really big deal. When Priscilla and Aquila came across him and found him teaching, he was teaching almost right. He, he, he taught up to a certain point. They said he knew understood the baptism of John, but he wasn't apparently teaching the crucifixion and resurrection. He didn't understand what the crucifixion and resurrection had to do with salvation. And so what did Priscilla and Aquila do? The scripture says they did what? They took him aside and taught him a better way. And he listened he didn't bristle at what they were saying. He didn't tell them they were wrong. He didn't quadruple down on his false teaching or his bad teaching. That's not what we're talking about here. That's not what Peter is talking about here. He is talking about intentional false teaching, which we're going to see here. So we're going to be in 2 Peter in, ver in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and we're going to look at the true nature, what Peter here is telling us, the true nature of false teachers. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that these folks have a form of godliness to them. And he's talking about lost people, but he said that has a form of godliness to them. They have a look about them that on the outside may actually kind of look like a believer, but <coughs> excuse me, it's actually not. That's the kind of thing we have to have in mind here. And so what he does here in these 11 short verses is to give us three aspects of their nature that we have to understand because i got to tell you, I don't know how we got here. I really don't. And when I say we, I mean, I mean believers, real true believers. I don't know how we got here to where we've gotten to the point where one of the things we will do on a, a, a consistent basis is excuse false teaching. I don't know how we got here, but it happens all the time you can point out false teaching after false teaching after false teaching after false teaching after somebody they really like and they really listen to and they just the excuses start coming out i don't know how we got here but that is not scripturally the response that we're supposed to have and we'll look at this as we go through because one of the things that peter's trying to tell us here in these first 11 verses verses is what is the nature of a false teacher who are they really? What, what are they, what, what, what is the thing that sort, of, uh, that sort of motivates them, that sort of defines them probably more is a better way to put it more than anything else. So let's look at chap uh, chapter, two, uh, chapter 2 of 2 Peter. There's a lot of twos in there. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow 
their sensuality and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven brothers, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds, that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious one. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here today, Lord, to see the importance of your word, Lord. That is all we have. All I have to understand you is your word, and the only way that I can understand your word is if you dwell within me. Your spirit gives me discernment. It gives me understanding. I could not figure it out on my own if I had a thousand lifetimes. And I thank you that you have revealed this truth to those who are called your children, to those who have received your free gift of salvation, to those you have adopted. May we be rightfully aware of your truth so that we can see untruth and understand where it comes from and what its goal is. May we never, ever, ever cease to seek your guidance in our lives, your leadership to the truth of who you are, so that you are lifted up and glorified and people are drawn unto you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So we're looking here at these three things that Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us about the nature of false teachers. And the thing he starts out with is, they know exactly what they are doing. This is not accidental. This is not like Apollos, who didn't know any better was teaching from what he knew and then was brought to the side, taught a better way, and then went out and taught the right thing. If you look here, but false prophets also among the, arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. He's hearkening back to their past. You remember, of course, that prior to the birth of John the Baptist and then followed very closely after that by the birth of Jesus, there was a period of time that has become to known as the 400 silent years. From the time that Malachi ended his his prophecy to the time that John the Baptist was born. There was a 400 year period where the scripture says God did not send a prophet to the people. It had been silent for 400 years. But the stories were still there. And the stories were still there about the prophets who did the good things and the prophets who did the bad things and these false prophets. And he's saying, just like your ancestors had to deal with false prophets in, in their time, here's what you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to deal with false teachers. Again, not ignorant teachers, not accidentally wrong teachers, false teachers. This is also a warning to us some 2,000 years later because God, of course, knew that we were going to be dealing with the same thing. It's one of the things He needed for us to be able to understand how important this is. These are not good-hearted people who just got it wrong. These are not people that are doing their best and working their hardest. That is not what this is talking about. When you look at these verses, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Does that sound accidental? To secretly bring in destructive heresies? Denying the master who bought them, they deny Jesus. Not outwardly so much. But at least inwardly they do. They get you questioning who Jesus actually is. 
And when they get you questioning who Jesus actually is, they have no problem telling you who he really is. That word really, man, it has a lot. There's a, there's a lot of stuff to mess up with that word really. You think you know Jesus? I know who he really is. Remember we talked about the Galatians? Right? Paul's letter to the Galatians, that they had listened to a different gospel. These people who were going in there said, yeah, I know you were dead. They didn't deny Jesus died on the cross. They didn't deny he rose from the dead. They talked about all of that stuff, but they also had it in there. But you want to know how you're really saved? How you're really saved is, yeah, he did the whole stuff on the cross and the resurrection, but you also have to do your part, which is, of course, completely opposite of what Scripture tells us. When somebody tells you that, your spidey sense should start tingling. Is it really what he was trying to say? Is it really what he's talking about there? Now, you might be saying to yourself, because I do this all the time, if I didn't believe this stuff, I'm, I'm just looking at it from my standpoint. I know that's an egocentric thing to do, right? And we're all egocentric to a certain extent, right? We all believe that people think just like this, and they don't, they should. So I know, I understand where this is coming from. But i got to tell you, I have tried to put myself in the shoes of people who do this, and my first question is, why? Why would you waste all of this time engaging in teaching that you know to be false over something you don't believe really in the first place? I'm thinking, i got a million other things I could do with my life other than that. I don't really get it and understand it. And the reason I don't really get it and understand it is because I haven't paid attention to what God is telling us here in 2 Peter because he's telling us exactly why false teachers do what they do. And many, and many will follow their sensuality and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And look at verse 3. And in their greed they exploit you with false words. In their greed. It is intentional and it benefits them in some way. That's ultimately what this is all about. It does benefit them in at least two ways that I can think of. There are probably others. The one is the most obvious one. There are a lot of people out there teaching a lot of false doctrine, and it has made them millions of dollars. Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. That one I think I do kind of understand. I mean, not to say that I would do it, but I at least understand it. That greed to, to have that money keep flowing in. Back in 1987, doesn't matter who it was, everybody's going to be Googling when they get home anyway, so if you don't remember this, and some of you will, some of you won't. Back in 1987, there was a well-known televangelist who locked himself away in his little building out there, and he told his followers that God was going to kill him unless... Eight million dollars was raised. I, by the way, in the words of the great Dave Barry, I'm not making this up. Everything I'm telling you is 100% true. That is literally what he said. God is going to strike me down if, if, if we don't raise eight million dollars. Now, for those of you who don't know that story, you may be asking, did it work? Well, he did not raise the $8 million. In fact, he raised $9 million. God did not tell him that because God would not tell him that. You see how many things are wrong with this? You understand, first of all, how in the world could a believer say that God calling him home is a threat? <laughs> How could that ever be viewed as a threat? I'm thinking, man, I'll take your place. Right? He can call me home right now and no money's involved. You see what he turns in God into? He turns God into a mafioso. Does he not? That's a really nice pastor you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to him. Of course, if I had $9 million, $8 million, I might be willing to look the other. You, you see how colossally false that is. And it worked it worked people believed that lie and willfully gave over nine million dollars because of that i get that kind of greed the other one is much more subtle 
It's the greed of communicating through our arrogance that we were the one that figured something out that nobody else did. It's a big deal for a lot of people. It's a famous mega church pastor, by the way. I have nothing against mega church pastors. He just happens to be a mega church pastor. I don't know if he's still there anymore. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Some years ago, he's in the Holy Land, right? He's in Israel, and he's got a driver who obviously would be Jewish since he was in Israel. And his driver was driving him around, and apparently in, in some, I don't mean, I don't mean to laugh. I, it just is kind of weird to me. Apparently in the conversation that he was having with the driver, the driver told him that we were looking at the Ten Commandments all the wrong way. His driver told him that because everybody knows drivers are 100% right about everything. And he said, no, this is the way we're supposed to look at the Ten Commandments. And so he comes home and decides he's going to start broadcasting this thing from the pulpit about this new view of the Ten Commandments. And the ridicule could not come fast enough. And he had to take about ten steps back and say, no, no, I didn't really mean any of that stuff. I was completely wrong about that stuff. Um, let, let, me, let me, can I give you just a, a tiny little piece of advice? We've talked about this before. If you read somebody or you're talking to somebody and they tell you that they've discovered something new in the scripture that hasn't been discovered ever before, run for the hills. The Bible has been the most scrutinized book on the planet for the last 5,000 years. Nobody is finding anything new. There is nothing new. And I don't understand why we buy into that. I don't understand why we glom onto that when we don't even know the old stuff. We don't even know the regular old stuff, but we're going after this new stuff. There is that greed that comes from that. There's an arrogance that comes with that. Oh, I figured this out, which means you need to listen to me, which is, of course, the then phrase of every known cult leader on the planet. I have special insight that you don't have. Now, I'm not talking about a different perspective on Scripture. That's not what I'm talking about. These passages that I'm preaching on here, you could get ten other people to preach up there, and there'll probably be ten different messages. They wouldn't be contradictory messages. They would just be ten different messages because there's a different perspective, right? It's like a diamond. Every time you turn it, it looks like a different diamond. But it's still the same diamond. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about this idea of finding something secret or hidden. It benefits them, and that's why they do it on, person, on purpose. In 2 Peter 3.16, which we haven't gotten to, we'll get to in a few weeks, Peter writes that these people who do this twist the Scripture. They twist it. Not they're accidentally messing it up. They are twisting it to their own ends. These are things that are done intentionally. False teachers do this intentionally. And there's really only one conclusion we can come to when we see that people are doing this intentionally, and we see this as the second thing he talks about here, is that the reason they are doing that is because they don't belong to God in the first place. Listen very carefully to these words. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived them among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and he heard. You see what God is doing here, at least I hope you do. In case we didn't understand this, in case we weren't seeing the gravity of what he was talking about here with false teacher, he compares false teachers not to one group of people, not to two group of people, but he compares them to three different groups of people. And the groups are the almost Mount Rushmore of lost people. He says what? False teachers? They're like the fallen angels. Right? The ones we read about in Genesis 5, the ones we read about in Jude 6, the ones that have become demons. He said, that's what false teachers are like. They're, they're just like the, these fallen angels. You know what else they're like? They're like the people in the day of Noah. You know who else they're like? You see where he's going with this? They're like the people of Sodom 
and Gomorrah. When you go back and look at these things and you see how horrible those actions were from all of those groups of people. Have you, have you read that stuff, by the way? Have you read? You know how bad Sodom and Gomorrah was? How really, really terrible it was? It was so terrible that God said, I will spare the entire city if I find only ten righteous people. The city was destroyed. So what does that say about the ten righteous people? They didn't exist. The people during the days of Noah, God said what? All they think about all the time is evil. Constantly, continuously, over and over and over. The fallen angels, the things, the despicable things that they did as they openly rebelled against God. He said, that's what false teachers are like. They're like all of those people. All of those people don't have good hearts. They just make mistakes. These are people who hate God. These are people who do the exact opposite. Who God? They are not his children. And Peter is trying to tell us this. And it is so difficult for us. I get it. I know it. I see it all the time. I've had this conversation over and over and over with people. And he's saying they are lost people, not simply misguided. They are lost. They're doing this on purpose. They are just as lost as the people who never hear the gospel. No matter how they look or how they sound, and that's what we go on, isn't it? Because let's be honest with you, most of the false teaching that we see on a regular basis, that's not like really overly crazy stuff, right? Because most people know how the crazy stuff sounds, right? I mean, you're always going to have the people that are going to say, I'm staying up in my tower because God's going to kill me unless I raise $8 million. That's kind of crazy. There's the other one I saw, the guy commanding that hair being grown on bald men's heads. That's kind of crazy, right? It's kind of weird. But that's not the majority of the false teaching that I have been experienced with. It's much more subtle than that. It's this idea that, yeah, I know what I'm talking about, and, and here's Jesus, and I'm talking about Jesus here, and Jesus died for your sins, and Jesus rose from dead. Cool, right? We love that. That all sounds really good. But then he starts talking about the nature of who Jesus is and the nature of salvation and what it is, and then it begins to divide. It begins to, begins to go on. And because these people are nice, or they seem nice, and they seem so well intentioned, I've heard them all. I've heard all the arguments. But he's such a good speaker. He gets so many things right. I hear that one a lot. But he gets so many things right. You do know in Scripture, almost right is not right. It's not. I heard a preacher story one time. I've heard a lot of them, but this one's actually really pretty good. And on top of that, when I tell you a preacher story, you know there's about a 99% chance it didn't actually happen, but the story actually sounds pretty good. So there's a guy who told his story because he was using it as an illustration for his, um, for his message based on this, this idea we just, we just discussed. Um, he, he knew this couple that was getting married, but he couldn't make the marriage ceremony. And uh, so he sent them something, he sent them a gift, and he sent a card along with it. So he's talking to the person on the phone about what he wants on the card. You know, congratulations, whatever the case may be, and he wants to make sure that he puts a, um, puts a verse on there. And the verse that he put on there was 1 John 4.18, which says, in part, perfect love casts out fear which is a great verse for a newlywed couple. But the people who took the information down didn't put 1 John 4.18, they put John 4.18. John 4.18 says, You were right when you say you've had no husband. You've had five husbands, and the husband you live now is not yours. <laughs> which is generally not the thing you want to send to a newly married couple. And there was one thing missing off of that, was there not? 
The number one. That was all that was missing from 1 John 4.18 to John 4.18. Almost right is not right. It doesn't matter how nice they are. I expect false teachers to be nice because if they're not, they drive people away. We're not doing anybody any good. We're not doing ourselves any good. We're not doing the gospel any good. One of the major things that separates false teachers from accidentally wrong teachers is the fact that they reject any attempts to show them otherwise. They get they quadruple down on it. They call people names. They do all of these other people these uh, these other things up there. I heard somebody say one time when I pointed out the fact that this person who supposedly has the gift of gift of prophecy has been wrong on about 87% of the things that they were prophesying. And I would say, how can this person just keep on? Well, let me personalize it. When I was on the ship, when I was on an aircraft carrier, we, 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 did, we did worship services, right? I did the Protestant service on Sunday morning. I had a friend of mine who did a different service on, it was actually my boss, he did a different service on Sunday night. The, the, the other service was different theologically for me. That's fine. It's no big deal. I'm glad for that. And he would let this guy teach. He would let this guy preach from time to time. And, and it, it wasn't really technically supposed to. It kind of violated the rules. Only chaplains are supposed to do this. But he would, he would let this guy preach. And I would not go on the nights when he let this guy preach. And when he finally asked me, Hey, Chaplain Purvis, why are you not going to the service on you know, some of those times I don't see you out there? I said, Well, sir, I'm not going to come when, when this guy is preaching. And he said, Why not? And I said, Because he's a non Trinitarian. <laughs> he's teaching heresy, he's a false teacher. I, I, and, and this was not a surprise to him, which is kind of where I'm going with this. This was not a surprise to him. And I said, sir, I got to ask you, I don't know how you let this guy teach. The Trinity is a basic foundational element of who God is. If we don't understand that, we don't understand him. If we don't understand him, we're not saved. I am thoroughly convinced, at least at that time, I hope something has happened between now and then, that that kid was up there preaching and he didn't know who God was. He had created a God of his own. Obviously, if he believed in a non-Trinitarian God, he created that God. That God doesn't exist. And so I challenged my boss. I said, sir, I don't know how you can let this guy teach. And he said two things that I thought were very interesting. One, he's got the spirit. Really, the spirit that's leading him to heresy? I think you and I are probably thinking about two different spirits here. Oh, he's got a spirit. But I don't think we're talking about the same one. Because the Holy Spirit's not going to lead him to heresy. <laughs> so we can't be talking about that. And the other is, I've tried to teach him to rise above his denomination. That is gobbledygook. I don't even know what that means. Or I'm trying to teach him to rise above his denomination. How about teach him not to commit heresy? Now, there's a thought. See, here's the reality. We have to understand how important this is. Am I saying going out and be mean to false teachers? We have people who, I'm not going to argue with them, but we have people whose whole ministries are designed around exposing false teachers. I, that would get tiresome to me, I think, if that was all I was doing. But the reality is we're not supposed to tolerate it at all. These people do not have their, your best interest in mind. They do not have a good heart. They are not... Oh, I write about this, but maybe a little off on this. That's not what that's good. And that's not me saying that, by the way. That's God saying that. They are no different than the people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no difference between the two of them. We've got to stop tolerating. Again, please don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about difference of opinions and theological positions. If you're somebody who's a pre-tribulation person and you're talking to somebody who's a post-tribulation person, neither one of you are heretics. You're not heretics and you're not a false teacher. It's not crystal clear. I think it's kind of clear, but it's not crystal clear. So it's okay to hold different views theologically. I get that. I understand that. I wish we didn't, but we do. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who know better or should know better, standing up there and saying, I know the Bible says that Jesus does X, but I'm telling you, you need to do Y. And people are just applauding them. And the scripture says, why would you do that? Why would you have any part in that at all? They have that form of godliness. Please remember that phrase. 
That's what Paul said. They have a form of godliness to them. They look on the outside like they're actually doing the right thing. But if you listen to their words, they are certainly not. And then the last part of their nature that he tells us here that, it's, that what happens to false teachers is the same thing that happens to everybody who rejects Christ, and that is what? They are doomed to his wrath in verses 9 through 11. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. He's saying if you think that God knows what he's doing here, he, he obviously punishes the unrighteous. These people are the unrighteous and they will not escape judgment. But the scripture does not let us off the hook. I'm going to assume if you're a believer that you're not a false teacher. Because you couldn't be a believer if you were a false teacher. But one of the things that I find fascinating about this entire subject is we have a tendency to focus all of our ire on the false teachers, which we should, don't get me wrong. We shouldn't let it pass. We shouldn't excuse it away. The scripture surely doesn't. So we shouldn't. But there's this really, really interesting passage that I'm sure that you have heard before that we're going to read here very quickly in... 2 Timothy that says something really interesting in relation to this idea. I charge you, this is Paul writing to Timothy and ultimately to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. You do, of course, realize, and what the Scripture is teaching us here, in that ultimately, if you have a false teacher, it really wouldn't matter if nobody were listening to them. So the, we're just as culpable. If we do, if we engage with that, we are just as culpable as the false teacher. Because it wouldn't matter how false the teaching was if we didn't have 15,000 people sitting in an arena listening to it. If all those people were gone, guess what the false teacher would stop doing? They'd stop false teaching, at least more overtly. This is a really big deal. I don't think we make a big enough deal about it. We cannot excuse, tolerate, or embrace examples of a teacher who over and over and over and over and over and over again say the exact opposite of what God's Word is saying. They are going to be judged as unbelievers. Jesus talked about these people. You remember that, right? There will be many on that day who will say to me, Lord, didn't, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do great and mighty works in your name? And you remember what God's response is going to be? Go away from me. I have no idea who you are. I never knew you. You were never a part of me. We are not doing false teachers any benefit. Because ultimately, what is the goal? What do you think the goal that I have for anybody out there that's a false teacher? I want them to repent. <laughs> I want them to believe. The reason they're teaching false teaching, the reason they're engaging is that, is ultimately the same reason that all of us end up in this spot where we're going to be condemned by God, and that is we just believe the gospel. That's what it ultimately comes down to. That's what, by the way, Everything comes down to it's belief of the gospel. False teachers, according to this ver these verses, they know what they're doing. They do not belong to God, and they are doomed to His wrath. Why? For the same reason that all who reject Christ are doomed to His wrath. They don't believe the gospel. It has been a while. I wanted to make sure we went through this today before we move into our time of communion of what the gospel is not and what it is. We have too many people, too many people who claim to be believers that cannot tell you what the gospel is. 
They can't. What is that? You keep talking about this gospel. What is that? Well, let's look at what the gospel is not first. The gospel is not simply going to church. Is going to church important? Yes. Everybody nod your head yes. Yes. Going to church is important. Is it the gospel? No. Is it where you hear the gospel? I certainly hope so. The gospel is not simply reading the Bible. I know unbelievers who read the Bible. Is the gospel in the Bible? Is the Bible important? Yes, of course, we should read the Bible. But in reading it in and of itself is not the gospel. Hopefully it is where you will see the gospel. It is not simply believing in God. Even Satan believes in God. And he is not saved. And it is not simply doing good things. These are all beneficiaries of the gospel, not the gospel itself. So what is the gospel? Very simply, we have to recognize that we are sinners. It doesn't make us evil, horrible people. It just makes us in desperate need of a Savior. We have to understand that. We have to know that our sin separates us from God. There is nothing we can do to earn that back. Realize we owe a debt for that sin, and that debt is our very lives. The wages of sin is debt, is, uh, is death. Except that this makes us an enemy of God. Whether if you, Again, before I became a believer when I was 20 years old, you asked me if I thought I was a, 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 uh, an enemy of God, I would have said no. No, I'm good with him, he's good with me, we're, we're good with each other. None of those things was correct. According to the scripture, we are an enemy of God. And understand, number five, what the gospel is, then that Jesus paid that debt on the cross, all of it, every single bit of it. It is finished, is that stamp of approval that says all of the debts have been wiped clean. Every sin I have ever committed, every sin that I will commit today, every sin that I will commit for the rest of my life was paid for on that cross. I cannot pay for it myself because I don't have the ability to pay for it by myself. He took the wrath for my sin and paid that debt. And then lastly, of course, Romans 10, 9 and 10, 9 and 10, confess and believe. You know one of the things I love about the gospel? It is so simple, even a kid can understand it. Even a kid can grasp on to these basic principles. If anybody's teaching other, anything other than that, especially when it relates to who Jesus is and what salvation is, we cannot tolerate that can all it's going to do is lead people further away from God to a God that doesn't exist I will look out at some of these folks and I'll see the arenas they preach in and I see these thousands and thousands of people and I hear what they're listening to and my heart goes out to them because they think they're okay and they're not okay. And the stuff they're hearing is pushing them incrementally step by step by step further away from God's truth. Be careful what you listen to. Don't take my word for this stuff. You've heard me say that over and over again. I will tell you again. Check what I say against God's word. My goal, obviously, is not to intentionally mislead you. Is it possible I could accidentally mislead you? Of course. Of course it is. Check what I say. Check what other people say. If it sounds weird, it probably is. It probably is. And know His Word. Because you can't know what His Word doesn't say. <laughs> if you don't know what it does say got to know and understand his word. That is the only true antidote to false teaching. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord, to come into your house. Lord, you, you, you have so many ways that you could have communicated your truth to us. You, you chose these 66 books. This is it. This is what we have to understand who you are. This is what you have given us to be able to uh, have you explain to us your nature, the nature of salvation, the nature of holiness, the nature of redemption, the nature of forgiveness, the, the nature of all of the, our natures, Lord, apart from you, how desperately we need you. All of this stuff comes from your word. Lord, for those who are here this morning who know you, 
Are they your children, Lord? Burden them with the desire to know your word. The only way we can know if something's not your word is to know what your word actually is. Burden us to study and to understand what all of this looks like. Lord, I, I, I wish there were no such thing as false teachers, but you, you warned us 2,000 years ago that this was going to be the case. And it will never stop until the day you come back. May we be willing to call out the teaching that we know to be false, to be intentionally false. That we would not tolerate it, we would not listen to it, we would not continue to explain it away. but to seek the truth of who you are. The only way I'm going to know you better is to know your word, the truth of your word. And I pray that you would reveal that to me every single day so I can see the glorious graciousness that you have bestowed upon me that you might adopt me as your child and that when I draw my last breath on this planet, I will be able to hear well done, good and faithful servant, and I will not hear, go away from me because I don't even know who you are. And that will be all because of you, your grace and your mercy. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.